Okay, you're back. That's nice of you to come back. I'm now in the fifth video here. And in this video, what I want to talk about is, okay, so we have this idea of a genetic algorithm, right? I have the algorithm itself. We talked about that at great length. I talked about how you can implement that algorithm in code. I looked at this sort of DNA object and population object, but the example was still just this kind of trivial example that just sort of demonstrates that the algorithm works by having a known result starting with randomness and arriving at that known result. What you want to do is have something more interesting where you might want to evolve a particular design or a particular animation behavior or something else that I, a piece of music, something that I can't even think of right now that's creatively in your head. So what I want to do in this particular video is talk about what are the pieces of that genetic algorithm that you could just copy from my code exactly every single time you use it and what are the places where you need to sort of interject and come up with your own creative solution to the particular aspect of the code. So let's look at a few examples of different uh, scenarios. I showed you this boxcar 2D example. This is in a way like evaluating the design of a physics element in a system through an evolutionary process. And you can see here, this is perhaps not the car that you would design manually, but it seems to be driving itself quite quickly um, through the genetic algorithm. So what are the pieces of this? What's the fitness function here? And how do you take this car and encode its design in DNA? Those are the two essential questions, by the way. Um, another example that I, that I uh, found here is by uh, Roger Johansson. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but somebody correct me on the internet if I'm not. Um, this is very similar the, to the to be or not to be uh, example, but instead of starting with kind of like random polygons, instead of arriving at a target phrase, this is starting to arrive at a target image through polygons. And you can see after a whole bunch of generations, what is that target image but the, mo the painting of the Mona Lisa. So you might think about, OK, well, this actually is almost identical to my um, to be or not to be example. But instead, there's like pieces of the DNA or colors and polygons and positions, vector information. What is that? How do you make that work? And then I'll show you. Um, oh, there's an uh, FAQ. There's some other links here. You can look at yourself. And then I'll show you one of my examples, which I have running here in the background. This is actually a pathfinding example. So what you can see here is there are something like a thousand little agents moving around the screen. If you've watched my videos on steering behaviors, these agents are actually following a flow field. I believe if I press this button, I can sort of make that flow field visible. This is the sort of, this is the DNA of each object. This is what it's in its brain, a grid of vectors around the screen. And ultimately, they're evolving what is the fastest path um, from the left-hand side of the screen to the right-hand side of the screen. But this is, example is a bit more sophisticated. I can actually draw some obstacles here. And these elements will actually start to evolve a path around the obstacle. And so I'll come back to this later and, uh, and, and see where it's gotten to, how far it's gotten, how good the evolution sort of is. But what I want to do is kind of stop. I've shown you these three examples. Maybe you have an idea in your head. What are the things you really, really need to think about? So looking back at the actual genetic algorithm here, I want to talk about two key places, two key places where you really need to interject your own creative spin on this algorithm. Everything else can largely remain exactly the same in any example, in any project that you're doing with the genetic algorithm. So let me come over here and kind of write these out. So number one is the fitness function. The fitness function that I had in the uh, to be or not to be example was counting the number of correct characters. That's not going to work for the the boxcar 2D example, that's not going to work for that Mona Lisa example, that's not going to work for my evolving a path uh, with a flow field example, right? You need to think about your particular project, what is the fitness function? Uh, is the music in tune or out of tune? Does the uh, steering agent make it to the target quickly or slowly? Does the thing run into an obstacle, yes or no? Does the image look like the Mona Lisa? Yes or no? So you need to come up with your own way of scoring each element of the population. You need to write your own fitness function. That's really key. The other key thing is, I'm going to say, how do you encode your DNA? This is really, really key. And what this brings up is this idea of genotype versus phenotype, right? This is a key concept from genetics that we can kind of 
have a very sort of simplistic view of here in the genetic algorithm that we're working with. So the genotype being the data itself or the encoding. The phenotype being the expression of that data, the manifestation of it, the visualization, the actual animation of it. And we, we were sort of spoiled by our example. The to be or not to be example, right? Here is the encoding of my random phrase. You know, unicorn. Oh, really it is an array of characters. U-N-I-C-O-R-N. -I -I That's the encoding. Here's the expression of it. Unicorn, right? That's the expression. It's the same thing. But in any of these other examples, if I go back to this Mona Lisa example, you know, the encoding might be a series of uh, an array of polygon objects, each polygon object having an array of vertices. It could be a giant array of, of RGB, a values for pixel colors, and then the expression is drawing it or animating it on the screen. Same thing here with box with the box car 2D. Like, how do you design that car? Oh my goodness, you have to have some type of node-based map to talk about how the different pieces of the car like fit together. That's the encoding. The expression is the thing actually moving. And in this particular example, oh, you can see by the way how far it's come. The objects have kind of evolved this flow field around those around these obstacles. I can make it harder for them by adding some more obstacles. But the encoding, the, 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 the phenotype is the expression, the movement of these objects through the flow field. But what's the actual encoding? It's an array of vectors. So the first example that I want to actually look at and see how this applied, uh, applies in actual code is an example called Smart Rockets. Um, this is actually based on an example made by Jer Thorpe many years ago. Uh, a, f a flash example on the web. I'll, I, I don't know if I can dig it up right now, but I'll include a link to it in the, this video's description. But, um, and it's simpler. This one is running in processing. I'm gonna, I'll leave this open. Actually, let's make it really hard. Let's draw some like, more obstacles. See if, it can, see if it can solve it anyway. That's gonna be hard. Um, I'm gonna go back to the browser, close this. You can see this is a, a version of this example working. It's a quite a bit uh, simpler. You can see that these objects, boy, they're not doing very well, are trying to find a path to make it from the bottom of the window <laughs> to the top. And uh, you know, it hasn't been running for very long, so they, they haven't done a very good job of it yet. So this is the same sort of problem as to be or not to be the question. Think of the number of possible paths there are from the bottom of the window to the top. An unfathomable amount. There's a lot of pixels, a lot of ways they could move. Um, uh, it's, so we're trying to search for the optimized fastest path and not running into that obstacle. So what's interesting about looking at the code for this, right? So let's think about this. Let me come back to my, uh, let me come back to the whiteboard for a second. So the fitness function, let's first think about the fitness function. My fitness function, this is the target. This is where they start. The fitness of each one of these rockets is the inverse distance. So the sh to the target that it, as, that it gets to at the end of its life. So the closer it gets to the target, the higher the fitness. So we calculate the distance between the target and the object, and then I say one divided by that distance. That's a way of calculating a fitness function. So that's a specific thing I had to invent for this. Again, there's lots of ways I could improve that fitness function, which I'd like to discuss. But that's a basic idea. So that's one thing. Then this idea of genotype versus phenotype. So if I come back over here, one thing that's really interesting to see, if I go to the code, right? Look at this. Here's a DNA object. It is exactly the same. Look at this crossover function. It's exactly the same as the Shakespeare example. Look at this mutate function. It's basically exactly the same as the, um, as the uh, Shakespeare example. There's this idea of a genes array, which is exactly the same. Everything is the same. Here's the one thing that's different. What goes in the genes array? Instead of picking a random character, I'm picking a random vector. So what each one of those rockets has is an array of vectors. That's like an array of forces that cause it to move around the screen. You can essentially think of it as like if the driver of the rocket has like this control panel where they can like press 
thrusters with a certain amount of force in a certain direction. That's what they're doing over and over again. And they're, the encoding of that rocket is the sequence of those thrusters, those forces to drive it around the screen. So what's interesting about this is this DNA object, if you look at the code between this, it's entirely the same. The difference is the genotype itself is no longer characters, it's vectors. So it might be floating point numbers, it might be characters, it might be vectors, it might be pixels, it might be polygons. It's up to you to think of what is that encoding of the thing you're trying to express. And in this case, it simply is vectors. Now, the expression of that happens in population because the population, uh, actually, sorry, it happens in the rocket object. So this is what was missing, right? In the, in the, in the, um, in my Shakespeare monkey example, there is simply a DNA object. That DNA object had both the genotype, the encoding of unicorn, and the phenotype, the expression of unicorn in it. I didn't need a separate object. But in this example, the encoding, the DNA, is vectors, and the expression is the rocket object. And the rocket object, if I come over here, is a physics object. It's an object that has acceleration, velocity, and position. And guess what? It has the DNA built into it. And when I, when I run it, look at this. This is the expression. Now, there's a lot going on in this example. But the expression is, go and look at its DNA and apply something from its DNA, the next sequence gene, as a force. So that's the expression. Take the vector and turn it into a force in the physics engine. So I would encourage you to go back and review my forces and vectors tutorial as well as my steering behaviors tutorial because this example this is essentially a vehicle object that has a physics engine built into it but it's how it moves is according to its genetic information and then you'll also notice that fitness function is right here in the rocket itself so instead of and I want to just make this wider so we can sort of see this for full fitness function for a second now I did say that distance the, the, function, the fitness function is 1 divided by distance, but I'm doing a bunch of things in, this, um, in the fitness function. I'm also checking to see if it hit an obstacle. I'm going to do a separate video about improving fitness functions, but I'm adding some ex extra math to the fitness function to make it a little bit stronger. And I'm going I'm to cover that, actually, I think just separately in the next video. I'm going to make a note of that to do that. So you can come back and I'll talk to that. But you can see here there's lots of stuff. There is a fitness value that's being calculated. OK, and we could go back and see it running. I don't know if they've reached the target yet. I'm going to have to look at like refining and optimizing this example by the time you click on the link in this description. Hopefully, it'll work a little better. I don't know if I just got kind of unlucky. I think this one thing might be is the sort of like maximum speed is very low. They seem to be going kind of slowly. So they're not. This one obviously has the highest fitness of that generation. But that's, this is basically the idea. So you, what you want to do is think about, use that core genetic algorithm. Again, if I look at the code, last thing I'll just sort of point out here is that um, um, you can see here in, in the draw loop, there are the same sort of set of functions. Calculate the fitness, perform selection, perform reproduction. There's a little bit of a different thing going on here where there's also time. Like in the Shakespeare monkey example, it's just like every frame, it did a new generation. Now it's sort of counting down, letting these objects live for a little while, then calculate their fitness, and then, um, and then, um, <laughs> my brain is like shutting down at the end of this video here. And then, um, and then like go and then reproduce for the next generation. Let's check on our, uh, the flow field, which is, ooh, it's running very slow probably because it's got the browser thing kind of going as well. Oh, because I have the debug on. Oh, I left that on. It's probably been running. Let's see, how well are they doing here? Have they made it around all these? No, they're getting stuck at this obstacle. I'm going to let this run for a little longer and maybe, uh, uh, I'll, later I'll update you somehow through another video of, of how these obstacles are doing. So I've given you a lot of stuff here. So what I think what, I, what you should really do is think about what, again, try to build your own scenario. Try to think about what is this idea? How do you going to encode the stuff that's the parameters of your system? How do you express those parameters visually through, through design or animation? And then how do you calculate a fitness to evolve those parameters over time? And I'm going to do a few more videos to show you a couple more scenarios. A scenario known as interactive selection, as well as a scenario known that I'm, that I'm calling loosely ecosystem simulation, which I'll get to too. OK, um, thanks for watching. And I will see you guys soon in another video, I hope. Thanks very much.